Let me get started. And I'm going to start with my introduction. My name is Donna Cash. I'm the State Homeless Coordinator for the McKinney-Vento Program here at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. My name is Jennifer Carter Dockler. I'm the Public Policy Director at the Missouri Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to partner today with Donna. Uh, we've served on the Governor's Committee and Homeless together for um, a number of years, and this is the first time that we've offered this webinar. So we're really um, excited to be able to do this. We know we both of our agencies end up getting a lot of questions about this. Um, and so we're hoping this will be the first time, but not the only time, that we end up offering this. So your feedback will be very very important as we continue to figure out what are the best um, points to be able to touch on and information you find most helpful. Are the screens moving? Hang on a minute. Technical issue. There. OK. Um, in a few minutes, there will be another screen that I talk about how to find our directory of service providers. But I want to make sure you have our website address, um, because that's where you're where you will find our directory service providers. Um, if you're not familiar with MCA DSV, um, our mission is that we unite Missourians with a shared value that, in, that rape and abuse must end and advances this through education, alliance, research, and public policy. Um, so we are the membership organization of the domestic violence shelters and rape crisis centers across the state. Um, so we're the major public policy voice between the national and state level. Um, we provide a lot of trainings both to our members and community partners such as this one and have a lot of great materials on our website that can help individuals um, navigate complexity around domestic and sexual violence. We've got a couple of our core publications on our website that might also be helpful to you. So I would really encourage you, if you haven't gone to our website um, at some point after the webinar, to be able to do so. Um, and I will talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, but that way you know where I work and what we do. So hopefully you have a relationship um, with your local domestic or sexual violence program. But if not, then I'll be showing you ways to be able to do that. So as mentioned, one of the outcomes we wanted to talk about today was resiliency. Um, when Donna and I were kind of planning for this webinar, um, we were debating should we just focus on domestic violence, yet many of our agencies are dual domestic and sexual violence programs, and a few of them might also be working with families who have experienced trafficking or sexual exploitation, and sometimes they're also experiencing issues with stalking. So I wanted to kind of take it broader, and I've also been really excited about uh, the information information that's been coming out in terms of promoting resiliency among children and families who have been exposed to trauma. And I think it also will connect to a lot of the points um, that are being asked of homeless liaisons um, in terms of what are provisions that can actually be helping to promote resiliency. And sorry, this I'm realizing this is a tad blurry maybe in the PowerPoint, but if you do a Google search of promising futures, um, you should get to this website, and this is an infographic off of it. It also has a lot of other information about like the ACE study in terms of children's exposure to trauma, what are ways that you can be partnering with domestic violence agencies, what are things that are really helpful to say to children who have been exposed to domestic violence. Um, but I really like using this infographic because I think it's a really quick and easy way to show how um, we can be helping to promote resiliency when individuals have experienced or their family has experienced um, intimate partner violence, stalking, or sexual assault. So for example, when we talk about access to services under the community, um, this is where homeless liaisons can be really um, helpful when you're, and we'll be talking about the additional provisions from ESSA, but you're supposed to be talking about referrals to substance abuse and housing. So there's access to services for families, um, knowing more about their options. Um, that can really help promote resiliency when they're able to engage then in services that maybe they didn't know about before. So you can be a huge link to that. Um, as well as our agencies, our domestic and sexual violence programs, can also be promoting resiliency among these families. Um, neighborhood cohesion is also a part of promoting resiliency. And Donna and I were talking earlier before this webinar about sometimes it can be um, complex deciding whether or not a child should be staying in origin, um, you know, the school of origin or residency. But sometimes staying in that um, school of origin can really help with that neighborhood cohesion, that they have some connection 
um, to the social support system and activities that they're used to. And so that can really help um, in balancing any sort of trauma that they might be experiencing or have experienced due to victimization. Um, this is also where stability can be really important. Um, so sometimes that school of origin is can he helping to continue that stability. And that's been shown to really help with resiliency, that elder family, that where we are able to help promote stability, um, that can be a really great protective factor. Role models are also um, a protective factor that promote resiliency, and this is where you can come into play. There are many individuals in a child's life that can help protect, um, promote resiliency, and you as um, a homeless liaison can also be a role model for that child and family to help promote um, resiliency. On the individual level, one of the things that we see promoting resiliency is mastery. And I'd like to make that connection with school, is again, if, if a child has been in a school and doing really well, um, that can be helping their sense of accomplishment. And so how can we make sure when they've been experiencing homelessness and victimization that we can help them continue to engage in those activities that are making them have a sense of mastery? Um, so again, I really like this um, infographic. I think that there's a lot of ways that it both shows what we're doing as domestic and sexual violence agencies, as well as our community partners, the homeless liaisons, are doing to help promote resiliency in these families. Um, and I think it also helps illustrate why some of the recommendations coming out and the new provisions with ESSA um, are important. So some of the changes, and um, Donna will be again touching on a little bit of this later on, um, but I really wanted to, to focus on where there might be um, a particular focus on learning about our domestic and sexual violence agencies in the state. So one of the changes is that liaisons are, must ensure that outreach, and outreach is new, and coordination with other entities. And so I'm really excited about this because oftentimes at MCA DSV, we're training the advocates at our member programs programs about McKinney-Vento and homeless liaisons and how these can be helping either qualified minors that their programs are serving or um, families with children. Um, who are in school, how that can be helpful. But you having to engage in this outreach will also help ensure that our programs are familiar with what you do. And so that way, they're hearing that message from multiple entities. Um, and so I'll be again showing you how you can find out who your programs are if you don't know to help um, with that outreach. One of the other changes is that public notice needs to be disseminated in locations frequently by parents, guardians, unaccompanied youth in a manner and form understandable to them. So I know Donna on the McKinney-Vento listserv the other week sent out a sample of the the poster that can be displayed. And that would be really great to make sure that our domestic violence agencies um, ha have that available and that they're able to put that in their lobby areas, their communal living areas. Um, we at the coalition just sent, um, we wrote an article in our newsletter that we just sent our membership earlier this week that provided a link to that poster. Um, so again, I think that that's another way that's really helpful to making sure that families know their rights and know that this is an option to them. Um, oftentimes, what I end up hearing from the advocate community is that um, survivors don't know if they want to go into a shelter or relocate because they're very concerned about their kids being able to continue in their current school. And McKinney-Vento is, is not something that many people in the general public are familiar about or know to ask about. And so I think having these this public notice, um, making sure that our domestic violence agencies and rape crisis centers have this available will help educate people about this option for them. So the liaisons must also ensure that you're able to provide referrals on housing. So you might have already been providing referrals to domestic or sexual violence agencies, um, but now housing is specified that those families must be receiving referrals. And so many people think about our domestic violence shelters and the emergency shelter they're offering, yet they might be offering other types of housing too. So it's important to know what kind of housing is available in your local community to be able to connect people to that. Okay, so this is where I'm going to talk about how you can find our DV and SV service providers in Missouri. I have a couple of caveats with it. So we are going to be on that same website address that was earlier in the presentation, so the mocadsv.org. The, the website address will stay the same. 
but in January we will be launching a new look of it. So this map will even look slightly different. Donna got this map off our website and so that is currently what it looks like, um, yet we will be relaunching a new look of our website which will make it actually much easier to navigate our directory of service providers in Missouri. So if you go to it now, just know in, in a month it will look different. So in a month it will be mobile friendly. And the directory, um, right now to find it, you have to click on the Need Help tab to, be, um, to go to this map. But in a month when the new website launches, the director, directory option will be kind of floating constantly on that first page. And so it will be much easier to find, especially if you're off a tablet or smartphone. So we're very excited about that change. Um, just a couple of things, though, about our directory. So this is one of the benefits that we offer our members. Um, every year, this time of year, we're asking our members to let us know if there's been any changes in their programs. You know, have they had additional grants that allow them to provide new services that maybe they didn't offer in the past? Or did they lose a grant and so they've lost a service? Maybe they've had a change in contact information. Any of that information that we're told during the year from our members, we immediately update on our online directory. So you're always going to get real-time updated information from our directory. There's two ways you can find information on our directory. There's an advanced search if there's a particular type of service you're looking for. So this might not happen very often, but if you are working with a family who's maybe considering relocating and wanting to know their options, um, pet fostering is, is a question that sometimes comes up. Which programs offer pet fostering? So you could actually do an advanced search trying to find which of the programs in Missouri have that program set up. There's also the option where you see our map like this, and we divide our membership into seven regions. And so you would click on the region where you're located, and then it would list all the programs in that region and the services they offer. And it is important to know the services they offer because one of the things I like to talk a lot about is we tend to shortcut our agencies just saying domestic violence shelter, domestic violence shelter. Yet they offer so many services. And if you're in a rural community, most of our agencies are actually dual domestic and sexual violence agencies. So we have individuals who have experienced sexual assault who had to leave where they were living and they're now in shelter because of sexual assault victimization. So in a rural area, most of our providers are dual domestic and sexual violence agencies. And so they offer many different kinds of services. Um, it might be shelter, it might be support group, counseling. They have hotlines that people can call 24 hours a day to be able to talk to someone. If someone's interested in getting an order of protection or has questions about it, they can call. If you have questions about provisions around orders of protection, you could either call us at MCA DSV because we're also a resource for you, or you can contact your local domestic and sexual violence program about that. Um, so I encourage you to know not just the name of the program, but know what services it offers, because that can also really help you with your referrals, um, because they do offer a range of services. Um, and so I just want to make sure that people know that. One of the ways that I think that our agencies can also be really helpful is potentially in dispute resolution. Um, so I think it's pretty clear cut when a family is staying in shelter um, that they would qualify for homeless. But there are many different definitions of what qualifies as homeless depending on what guidance you're looking at. And the Ken Vento has a really broad definition. And so one of the most common scenarios I could see where our advocates could really be helpful um, is when somebody isn't staying in shelter, yet we know due to safety planning with that family that they're currently residing someplace place that isn't permanent. So the most common scenario that this might happen is somebody calls one of our hotlines and we say our shelter is currently full, but let's strategize if there's another place you can currently stay temporarily until we have space available into our shelter facility. So they might be currently staying with friends or family, but it's not permanent. Some of our programs also maybe have motel placement vouchers where they're able to temporarily house somebody in shelter before going into more of like a structure facility. And so I know when Donna had done her presentation to the Governor's Committee on Homelessness recently, she said one of the more common dispute resolutions when they come up is confusion about doubling up. When is it um, temporary versus permanent? And so if it's not a permanent ongoing roommate situation, 
then if a family who has experienced victimization is temporarily staying with someone because it's a better option than, than staying in a sh in on, on the street or because the current shelter is full, our advocates can be helping to educate people about, well, that should be qualifying for McKinney-Vento and what can we do to help with that. Or sometimes they might get a phone call from a family who's currently living in their car because they just relocated from a different community and didn't know where to go. And so they grabbed their belongings and just drove their car to the facility. Um, and so also being able to educate about how living in a car should still qualify a family or a qualified minor for McKinney Vento. So non-regulatory guidance came out. Um, it's called the Education for Homeless Children and Youth Program Non-Regulatory Guidance. It was issued July 2016, and it includes provisions about McKinney-Vento, as well as with ESSA, some new guidance that put out. And so this is what I'm going to spend kind of the bulk of the rest of this talking about. Um, and try not to make it too dry, but it is kind of statute in nature. Um, so it may still be a little dry. Um, but there's a couple of sections of it that I wanted to make sure I point out that really directly relate to our domestic and sexual violence programs. So one of the parts of it was regarding privacy and confidentiality. So what additional steps should a homeless liaison take to protect student privacy and ensure that student records are secure? So privacy is a huge concern when victimization is an issue, particularly in intimate partner violence situations. We never know when the abusive partner might be trying to find out information relating to the family's safety. And so we really want to make sure that, that we're taking safeguards to protect student privacy. Um, and even just when they've done studies on people who have experienced sexual victimization, they've said that one of their top concerns is privacy. They really don't want a lot of people to know what they've experienced. Um, they might have a lot of shame associated with it. And so they want to make sure that their privacy is a top concern. So really think about you know, where you're holding conversations with students, um, trying to prevent that information from being overheard, um, and working with school personnel to secure that personal identifying information. So that's what the PII is <laughs> um, working to secure that. Part of why, especially in domestic and sexual violence, we end up being so mindful of privacy and confidentiality is because sometimes there is human error, and so we don't want that to have an unintended consequence on families that we're trying to serve. There was a news article that just came out the other week that HUD accidentally put a database on their website that they weren't supposed to that included people's social security numbers, all sorts of personal identifying information that wasn't supposed to get put on their website. They accidentally did it. And so we're very mindful about what information, when it comes to survivors of domestic violence, what information gets put out there. Because sometimes accidents do happen. Or sometimes you have partners who are really manipulative and trying to find out what people's safety options are. So wanting to keep that in mind. So also Part of this guidance is they said, you know, in particular, many homeless students are survivors of domestic violence or have other safety issues that must be addressed in student records and information release procedures. Failure to protect personal information can result in an inappropriate release of information that endangers students, caregivers, and possibly even school personnel. So again, we want to be mindful when somebody has disclosed this. Who are we sharing this information? How are we being mindful of that um, in our release of information procedures? In addition, and this is what I'm going to be spending um, the next few slides talking about, is what is VAWA and what is FIFSA? And this is when you're working with our domestic and sexual violence agencies so that you know the guidance that they have for them. So the guidance um, had said, you know, in addition, the Violence Against Women Act of 1994, which we call VAWA, um, it was reauthorized um, several times, most recently in 2013. Um, and the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act, which we call FIPSA, it contains several provisions governing how domestic and sexual violence agencies can share victims' personal identifying information. So I just want to talk some about that so that you know when you're collaborating with our agencies what to expect and you're not thrown off about it. So what is confidential information? Um, this comes from MCA DSV standards. Um, we create the standards for domestic and sexual violence agencies in the state for quality assurance. So confidential information includes any written, electronic, or spoken information and communication between a person seeking or receiving services and any program staff 
volunteer or board member in the course of that relationship. Any records or written or electronic information identifying a person to whom services are provided and any information about services provided to an, to an individual. So that's pretty much anything we're doing. <laughs> so we're very mindful of that. We have to have a specific release of information from the individual who we are serving to be able to talk to another entity um, about that family. And then that family has to have given us specific permission about what we can be talking about. You know, Can we confirm that they're in shelter? Can we confirm what kind of services are being provided? Can we coordinate with another service provider about their options? But we have to get specific release of information for that. What is personally identifying information? Although it was mentioned in that guidance several times, um, I thought I would add some of the information that we actually train our advocates on. Um, so although some types of information is obvious, such as social security number, a variety of seemingly general information can be combined to identify an individual. And that's why it's really important to be thinking about how you present information in combination and really controlling the release of that information pertaining to service recipients um, because that helps protect their identities. It's also something to be mindful of when you're talking about examples of families you've worked with. And so for example, a while back, we had seen a news article of one of our programs that was from a very small community, and they had given a lot of details about a family they had been working with in a news report. Um, and although they never said the name of the family, the names of the children, um, because this was such a small community and there were some real unique identifiers about this family based on race and country of origin, it was very obvious in that community who this family was that was being discussed. And so I share that example because keeping in mind with personal identifying information that even if you're not specifically saying somebody's name, if you're giving enough details, it might potentially still out that family. So thinking about it this way, personal identifying information is that any information alone or in combination that would identify a specific individual and may not be shared with a third party. So this is you know, the provisions for our agencies versus aggregate data, which cannot be traced back to a specific individual. This can easily be shared with a third party. So we're talking about our sums. Like we, sh we served 10 families last year and not going into the details of, of dynamics of those families. Personal identifying information is a first or last name, home or physical address, contact information, date of birth, social security number, versus number of women and men and children served, number of hotline calls, age ranges of participants. So when we're working, when you're working with one of our local agencies, um, we would need a release of information to be able to talk about any of these personal identifying factors. And again, just keep in mind, can aggregate data identify a person? It is possible. Information becomes personally identifying when it could be used in combination with any other non-personally identifying information and would allow someone to identify an individual. Um, there was a study that found zip code, birth date, and gender from census data can be used in combination to re-identify 87% of individuals in the United States, um, especially when program staff are in our rural area. So we're we know that sometimes um, when we're working under confidentiality, it can, it can come across sometimes as a barrier, yet the intention behind it is we're really wanting people when they have huge safety concerns to feel comfortable sharing that with our agencies and so um, wanting to make sure that we protect that. So a little bit about VAWA and FIPSA. So again, the Violence Against Women Act um, originally was passed in 1994 and then reauthorized in 2005 and 2007. And so it tells our domestic and sexual violence agencies that personal identifying information is a first and last name, a home or other physical address, contact information, social security number, or any other information including date of birth, racial or ethnic background, or religious affiliation, which in combination with any other non-personally identifying information would serve to identify the person. So we have to be very mindful of that unless we have a release of information. So any of our local agencies that receive federal funds associated with VAWA have to maintain confidentiality. We have to get a release of information um, and so we're very mindful of that. Um, so VAWA also says that programs receiving these funding, again, cannot reveal individual client information without the informed written consent of that person. So that release of information is very important because we must protect the confidentiality and privacy of adults, youth, and child victims of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, and their family. 
So again, these are provisions for our agencies, but I just want you to be aware of we have many layers of this. We also have FIPSA, the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act, which says that programs receiving those funding, which pretty much all of our programs receive our FIPSA funding, um, they must develop and implement procedures to assure the confidentiality of records pertaining to any individual provided family violence prevention or treatment services and provides assurances that the address or location of a shelter facility except with written authorization of the person um, shall not be made public. We also have state law that again just reiterates that if our agency is a domestic violence shelter or a rape crisis center that they must maintain confidentiality. What's also unique about Missouri is we have a Supreme Court case that also upheld the confidentiality of our programs. So I, I don't want to belabor it, but part of the guidance <laughs> had said make sure that the homeless liaisons understand the confidentiality provisions available for domestic and violence agencies and sexual assault agencies. So when they're coordinating and collaborating with them, they're aware of it. But just for you to know that in Missouri, Especially, we have not only federal law, we have state law, and we have a Supreme Court case. That means we have to be very mindful. So if we're working with the same family, we're going to have to have a release of information, or we're going to say we can't confirm or deny. One of the other questions from the guidance was prohibition on segregation. So may a district educate homeless children at an off-site facility such as a shelter? So no, homeless children and youth must be educated as part of a school's regular academic program and services must be provided to homeless children and youth through programs and mechanisms that integrate homeless children and youth with their non-homeless peers. Um, so again, I think that this helps um, reiterate some of the things that we talked about in the resiliency and why that might be important in terms of stability and connection with peers. Um, may a school separate a child from the regular school program if he or she resides in a domestic violence shelter? Oops, I missed a word. Um, no. So however, schools can and should coordinate with domestic violence service providers and others as appropriate to take all other necessary steps to protect any child who is a victim of domestic violence, including being a witness. Um, in this way, schools can address safety concerns and provide equal educational opportunities without causing further disruption in children's lives, again, which promotes resiliency. And I think I might have missed a couple of questions. I'm trying to scroll back up. They, they got addressed? OK, great. Some great information um, from Jennifer. So I know that was a lot to take in. And so if you have additional questions, feel free to type them in the chat pane and we'll address those as we go along, but we will make sure that they get addressed before we end the calls and the webinars today. And you can always feel free, we've got our contact information at the end of these slides so that you can email us or uh, reach out to us if you have additional questions. I think this is a really timely webinar for both programs because of ESSA and all the requirements that are coming with that new legislation. So we're going to take a few moments to talk about the McKinney-Vento Act and how we play into this, okay? So as you can see, I, I think when we have talked to uh, children who have been uh, homeless in the past and are now grown and in post-secondary education, or we've talked to them after they've received services from a homeless liaison, that they really uh, reiterate to us that it was really critically important that they had that one person in their life that knew uh, that they needed some special attention. And so you play an important role as an LEA liaison for that child. Um, oftentimes I get phone calls and ask for guidance about what can we do for this and uh, what can we do for that. And one of the things I always tell people is that, you know, just providing a mentor so for a child. It's just somebody that might be able to just mentor that child by going up to them in the cafeteria room and taking a few minutes just to lay eyes on them and take a few minutes to discuss with them how they're doing, if they need any assistance. So please keep in mind how important your jobs are because they are extremely important. And Debbie, to answer your question, to get onto the homeless listserv, which is how we communicate throughout the department with our homeless liaisons. We have a link on the homeless webpage. Um, it's in the little quick box. And there, I hope that's better. Is that better as far as sound? You can get onto that homeless listserv. We've actually posted that. Thank you, Julie. All right. 
So just give you a little background on the McKinney-Vento Act, um, because I think the teacher in me wants to do that, and I'm a history buff myself. So um, the act first came about during the Reagan administration by two um, senators. Uh, the first law was put into place by Stuart McKinney, and then it was picked up by Vento, uh, Senator Vento, and so it became the McKinney-Vento Act. I'm not going to read this slide to you. You can certainly do that yourselves. But in December of 2015, the Every Student Succeed Act was signed into law by President Obama, and that created a lot of changes for us under McKinney-Vento. So we have a lot more duties as homeless liaisons, so we hope this webinar helps kind of clarify some of those, and if you have questions, you can certainly, you know, contact me. But that's a little bit of background. So if you have people asking, I know when I first told my parents that I was um, taking this position, my dad's question was, we have that many homeless kids in Missouri? We do. Um, unfortunately, we have over a million point two students across the nation that fit into McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness. And like Jennifer said, our definition um, is really different than a lot of others. Um, so keep in mind that the federal law supersedes any state laws that we have, and McKinney-Vento is a federal law. So our main themes are, of course, making sure that our students have access to school, that they can access a school without school records. Um, so if they're coming to you from uh, a victimization um, problem that they might have encountered, they don't need those school records to enroll in school. We're going to get those school records after we enroll them. Stability, of course, is meaning that they can go back to their schools of origin. So while the rest of their life might be in a complete upheaval, the one stable piece may be the school. And then, of course, any kind of support that they might need for academic success. And that may mean tutoring. That may mean counseling. It may be a whole host of different issues. Maybe they need medical referrals or the housing referrals that we've spoken of today. And of course, keep in mind that these are always child-centered, best interest decision making. So at the heart of McKinney-Vento, we want to make sure that we're educating students, but we want to make sure that we're doing what's best for them, too. So let's take a moment just to go over that homeless definition because it does differ so much. And it has changed with ESSA. So homelessness is described as a child who lacks a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence. And so each of those has to be met, fixed, regular, and adequate. So in, um, when we're looking at fixed, we're talking about something that's permanent. It doesn't change. I have a legal right to be in the home. I'm not living in someone's basement. I'm not living in someone's... Um, tool shed in the backyard. I'm not living somewhere that I can hook a, uh, a big uh, truck to it and pull it away. Regular means that I go back there night after night so that I'm going home every night to the same place. So I'm not going to Aunt Sue's on Tuesday and then I'm leaving there because her boyfriend comes home and I can't be there Wednesday. So all of those different little components that you might get when you're talking to families. Adequate and the law has changed. If you'll look at the new legislation legislation under ESSA, they actually give us some meat and guidance to what adequate means. It talks about the uh, mold issue. It talks about heating and cooling and all of those things. So it was really nice to see the new legislation, um, to have that new legislation kind of spell out what adequate means. Because I think that that's often what I get a lot of questions on. So heating, cooling, windows, roof that doesn't leak, the house is habitable, it's safe. Um, what does it mean to be living and have the legal right to live there? So in other words, I own a home, I hold a mortgage, I hold a lease on it. So I'm not actually just living there because someone has opened their home to me out of the kindness of their heart. Because you could have families that are living doubled up, and we see that happen a lot where they're doubled up with one another. And so I don't have a legal right to be in that home. The lease is in someone else's name. So if law enforcement became involved, let's say that we got into an argument over something and we got a little loud and the neighbors called the law enforcement, who would be asked to leave that home? It wouldn't be the homeowner or the lease see, it would be me, the person who's living doubled up. That's what that legal right to live there means. And doubled up simply means that I'm living doubled up. I'm couch surfing if I'm a teenager, perhaps. I've had families that are couch surfers. So doubled up means that I'm living with someone else in their home. It's not my home. It's theirs. So I could be asked to leave. So here are just some causes of homelessness, and I'm sure that as you've done these jobs, some of you have really uh, done them for a long time. Um, 
So lack of affordable housing, that's a big one. Um, we just don't have enough Section 8. Some areas of our state that are rural don't even have Section 8 housing or don't have low income housing. A divorce can create um, homelessness because now instead of having two incomes, I'm down to one. We're talking about domestic violence and victimization today. Of course, that's another reason why I might flee my home. I might have an illness or an injury that causes me not to be able to go to work. And then I fall behind in all my bills, um, those insufficient wages as we talk about um, as a country about minimum wage and how much is minimum wage, what should it be, lack of child support. So I'm a, a single mom, maybe um, banking on the fact that I'll get my child support to help me pay my rent. And then all of a sudden, uh, the child support dries up. And now I can't make my rent. Of course, natural disasters, fires, floods, tornadoes, anything like that. And uh, so we're getting a question, what about a family who lives together under one roof by choice? Uh, they aren't legally there, but they decide to do it to save money or another choice. Is that still considered homeless? I think that's something that you would look at very carefully, uh, Tracy, and say, what precipitated the move for the family being together? Is it because, uh, let's say for example, me and my brother decide to share housing so that we can care for an aging parent? That would be a choice, right? That would be me and him making a decision that we don't want our parents perhaps in a nursing home so we come together and, and make a home so that they can stay together, right? So that may be a choice. It may be a choice of two single mothers moving in together so that they can share on the rent. Again, those are all choices, but at the same time it is something that I think if you had those kind of scenarios that it would be something that you keep an eye on because if those two single mothers, even though they may be friends, decide to move in together, it is something that could break apart very quickly. And if that happened, then you could be facing some homelessness and have students who are in a homeless situation. Great question, by the way. So here's some just data if you want to, um, if you're trying to present McKinney-Vento to your board or to other um, perhaps service providers or even school personnel. So 39% of America, uh, the homeless population, are actually children. And it's even scarier when you look at the second statistic. Uh, they're under five years of age, OK? And 42%, out of the 42%, only 15 are enrolled in a preschool program. And we know how important that is. 38% um, of the homeless population uh, have less than a high school diploma by the age of 18. So it's very important that we keep these children in school and that we're providing services and helping them stay in school. And out of the 50% of the homeless population, uh, they report dropping out. Because if they have to make a decision between going to school and making a living so that they can put food in their bellies and a roof over their heads, they're going to choose that second option every time. So we're going to have to reach out to those students and make sure that they have other options and that they know what those options are. So here is just a, a big fat number, right? We're almost at a million from back in 2009-10. But look at the jump that we had, 1.2 million in school year 10-11. Now some of that, of course, is because of the foreclosure crisis. We know that happened. We know that our numbers jumped substantially after that. And it's simply because people couldn't afford, um, you know, maybe they lost their housing by no fault of their own. Perhaps they were renting from a landlord. And it wasn't them that did make the payments. Maybe it was their landlord that then had the foreclosure and then they lost their housing. So these data only represent the students that were, have been reported to. So oftentimes when we're out doing workshops or we're out and talking to other service providers, we feel that, that number doesn't always include everyone. It certainly doesn't include preschool age children or infants and toddlers who might be facing homelessness. So here's what those statistics look like for uh, Missouri. As you can see, uh, we did have substantial gains um, throughout the years. So the question I always get is why? Why are we seeing such a jump? I think it's a number of things. I think our economy has not uh, bounced back after the foreclosure crisis. I think that we're better at identifying students. I think that people are more aware of McKinney-Vento and perhaps that they are self-reporting. So I think it's a factor of a whole, whole lot of different factors. And so I think that you'll see that number um, in the past. We're seeing a little bit of planing out of that number, so not such significant jumps. But you'll notice that you know we've had some gains. And um, so 
we have the problem. We know that we have homeless students out there. Now it's our jobs to make sure that those homeless students get the services that they are entitled to under McKinney-Vento. So here are just some enrollment barriers that our children uh, who face homelessness encounter. Um, oftentimes I get calls from parents saying, you know, they want school records or they want immunizations. They want proof of residency or other records that they are required to provide to schools when they enroll. Keep in mind, when they're McKinney-Vento, these enrollment requirements are not there. We are going to enroll immediately. We're going to then reconstruct those enrollment requirements after we get the students enrolled. Okay? They're highly mobile, our families are. So they don't have uh, school stability. They don't have that continuity that other students have. And it oftentimes is reflected in their grades. They lack transportation or school supplies or even clothing. Um, I read an article just yesterday about homeless students and um, some of the requirements that we require our students to come to school with for uniforms. And it was, the article was pointing out the fact that you know families can probably buy one uniform, but um, not more than one. They can't afford maybe two or three. So what they find themselves is that oftentimes then the students uh, come to school with dirty clothing or they don't even have the clothing. Schools might help provide them after school gets started. Well, they come to school the first day and they're out of uniform, so they get detention. Well, that's not hardly fair, is it? And so if you have policies or procedures about those kind of issues, then they need to be looked at because they would be considered a barrier for a student. So oftentimes, um, our families have poor health, fatigue, and hunger. Um, a lot of our students have never seen a dentist. Um, a lot of times when I'm talking to McKinney-Vento liaisons and they're asking about what services can they provide to a family, um, I find myself with mental health issues where they, they need mental health services or they might need dental. So those are the referrals that we were talking about earlier with Jennifer was those referrals that families need to these service providers. They may not be able to or not know how to navigate service providers. So you may have to assist families in getting those services that they need. And oftentimes they face prejudice and misunderstanding. A lot of times people just say, well, you know, if they just get out and get a job, then they can, you know, for certainly not be homeless anymore. It may not really be that simple. We'd like to think that all of our problems are, but they aren't. So it might be something much more complicated than that. So they do face that prejudice and misunderstanding. So we want to make sure that we do away with some of that. So remember, students who lack a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence. And the law then goes into some very specific categories in the law. So they talk about families who are living in motels, hotels, and campgrounds, even the extended stay hotels. Um, so the extended stay hotels are not meant for families to live in. They are meant for businessmen to come into a community and do business and maybe stay for a week or two, scoping out the landscape, seeing if their business might want to move to a particular community. That's what those extended stays are truly meant for. They're not meant for families of four or five to live in for an extended amount of time. Um, if they're living in an emergency or transitional shelter, they automatically qualify for McKinney-Vento. Places that aren't designated for humans to live, so abandoned buildings, abandoned railroad cars, um, those families who are living in their own cars, parks, abandoned buildings, bus or train stations. Um, let me talk on about the car situation for just a few minutes too. Uh, as we had in the last few days, temperatures really dropping into the teens at night and families living in cars. I often get the question about, you know, if I know a family's living in a car, um, your job is to make referrals. So those referrals may be to shelters or they may be to a uh, ministry alliance to where the family can get assistance for a hotel for the night. So keep in mind, those are your jobs as a McKinney-Vento liaison. And the new law under ESSA also makes the, you know, the qualifier that homeless liaisons have to have the capacity to do the job. So if you find that you have a large population of homeless children in your school district that you're trying to do McKinney-Vento and you're trying to do Title I and you're trying to do maybe ELL, you don't have the capacity to do all these jobs and that is something that needs to be addressed at the district level. Um, 
And Tracy has another question. Uh, since the law prohibits us from requiring proof of residency, how do we determine the true housing situation for the family? How much are we allowed to do to follow up on the information that we do receive? Well, Tracy, a lot of times it is just talking to the family and asking for documentation to see if they have it. You can certainly ask them if they have um, a foreclosure notification that they might be bringing into you if they've told you that they've been foreclosed on. Um, they can certainly, you can certainly ask for it, but it's not a requirement for them to provide that to you. Uh, they can, you can take them at their word. And then, how do you do the? You know, how do you find out later if a family has actually been uh, displaced? A lot of times. Fixing the transportation is a way that you can find out where that family is putting their head down at night. But a lot of times it is taking them at their word because I really truly don't think that people are going to be taking advantage of the system by saying that they're living uh, doubled up or living in a homeless situation. I, I haven't seen that much of that in my part of the career that I've had with McKinney Vento. There's going to be some that try to um, fix the system and try to work it, but as a whole, I don't believe that they do. So you certainly have the right to ask questions, but they are not required to provide documentation to you, OK? So it's just a matter of having that conversation. And keeping in mind some of the things that Jennifer mentioned in her earlier presentation about being um, very cognitive of the fact that they, they deserve privacy, and they deserve to have this conversation with you in a private setting and uh, making sure that you're not asking questions that might then jeopardize their current living situation. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this. Children who live with friends or family because of a loss of housing or similar reasons should be considered uh, homeless. They're living in a double up situation. We see this oftentimes with um, teens as we get into the 15, 16, 17 year old age groups uh, because they've left home for whatever reason. Um, Again, it's a conversation you have with that student or family, and you're trying to make that decision about their living situation. Are they living doubled up because they have no other way to have a roof over their head? And I think that's a prime example of a good question that you ask a family as you're having that uh, conversation. If you're having that conversation, ask them, if you couldn't go back to wherever they spent the last night. If you can't go back there, where would you go? If their answer is, I'd live in my car, or I'd have to go live doubled up with so-and-so, or I, I don't know, then chances are you have a homeless family. So. Um, we have another question from Megan, and it's how can we support families that meet the McKinney Vento definition of homeless but do not personally identify as homeless and don't want their children to be considered homeless and that to be part of any type of school record? Um, keep in mind, Megan, that you are under a federal mandate to identify students. And so oftentimes that's what I tell um, homeless liaisons. If you're having a conversation with a family and they're saying, you know, they're giving you all the indicators that they might be homeless, right? Being based on the information they're providing to you. You are mandated to then identify them as McKinney Vento. So they are not going to see that you're putting that in the student information system. So it's a matter of you identifying them. And so the only thing that you would probably be providing to that family is maybe free and reduced lunch. So I think that you're, you're walking a tightrope where you have to talk to families, make sure that you're identifying those families as homeless, make sure that they understand what their rights are under the homeless provisions under McKinney-Vento. Because maybe they don't want to be identified as homeless, but they don't realize that if they're not identified as homeless and they lose housing and have to skip over to the next county, their kids can't go to school anymore if you didn't know they were homeless. So I think that's something that you have to keep in mind, making sure that a parent understands what their rights are under the law for school of origin and school of residency and what that identifier means to them and their students if, they have to, if they're unstable enough that they're jumping from place to place to place. We want to make sure that that student has stability in their education while everything else in their life is kind of chaotic. So making sure that you're giving the families the information that they need to make some good decisions, okay? Um, let's see. And then we had another question. Uh, 
Yeah, you do see that. They don't live in the district but claim to be homeless so they can attend our district. It's frustrating because I feel that we are stuck between a rock and a hard place with the law prohibiting requirement of proof. How do you deal with situations like that? Well, Megan, I think one of the tools in your toolkit is, is your enrollment forms. Your enrollment forms oftentimes have those disclaimers on them about, um, you know, if they're providing false information. It is a misdemeanor, you know. So it is a matter of you having those conversations with parents and making sure that you're asking all those right questions. Because it is important for you to understand if the family is using the McKinney-Vento Act as a way to navigate um, trying to get into a school. We don't have school choice in Missouri. That's in Kansas. So here in Missouri, they have to go to the school districts that they're eligible to attend, whether that's the school of origin or whether that's the school of residency and it's up to us to make the right questions and make sure that we have the right answers and are making the right determinations. I think it's really important so families know what they're entitled to under the McKinney-Vento legislation. It's not just a matter of trying to access school, but access services too that they might not know that they need or might not know that they qualify for. So um, I think that the most important thing is that eligibility, when we're making that determination, it can't violate their privacy. Um, I think that's new under SF. You'll, I, I think I sent out a listserv talking about this when you're investigating cases, especially if you're using your school resource officers or other people. It's very important that we don't violate the privacy of a family because it jeopardizes their housing arrangements. And there have been lawsuits all across the nation. And I certainly don't want something like that to happen. And um, in a situation where, you know, families are McKinney-Vento eligible, but yet you've jeopardized their housing. Okay. All right. Um, we also had another question. If, what if a teenage student has a home but chooses to move in with someone else because they don't want to go by their parents' rules, etc.? Um, Donna, I think that in those situations, I think that you need to do some exploring with that student because what I have found is while there might be cases of that, typically there's something more behind that. So again, it's those in-depth conversations that you're having. You need to really make sure that you're asking the right questions and making the right determination. Okay. All right, so here's some key questions that I tell school district liaisons to ask. Where did you stay last night and where do you play, plan to stay tonight? Those leading questions are going to really answer some questions for you on whether or not a student meets the definition of McKinney-Vento. Um, you know, here are some questions that you might want to consider using. Um, we've got some forms out on our website that can certainly help you with these situations if you're trying to make a determination and you need some additional guidance. Um, you know, are their living situations intended to be temporary or is it a long term? Is it temporary because I lost my job and I hope to get a job? Um, is it long term like we spoke before about taking care of aging parents? Then maybe that isn't McKinney-Vento. But maybe it is something that's McKinney-Vento. Maybe I've been divorced and now I can't afford my home anymore because I don't have that second income. And did the student move into the house as an urgent measure to avoid being on the street or in another precarious situation? I think those are questions that oftentimes we forget to ask our students and families as they come in. So children who are runaway, okay, even if their parents have provided or are willing to provide a home for them, are covered under McKinney-Vento. And those children that are throwaway children, we've seen more and more of this throwaway situation in the last couple of years. Um, they're considered homeless until they have a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime resident established for them. School-aged unwed mothers or mothers-to-be who are residing in a home for unwed mothers. Um, undocumented children and youth who have the same right to attend a public school as a U.S. citizen does. <laughs> and what does a throwaway child mean? It's a child that a parent may have left. So in other words, um, I have three children and I drop them off with my mother and say, you know what, I just need a few days by myself and I never come back for my kids. That's what we refer to as throwaway children. Um, parents kind of abandon them for a better choice of words. So we talked a little bit about the changes under ESSA. And remember that as of December 10th, and that's Saturday, we're not quite to December 10th yet, um, 
foster care students awaiting foster care was part of the definition for McKinney-Vento. But as of December 10th, the awaiting foster care is no longer considered McKinney-Vento. Okay? So <clears throat> Beth Eisenberg is now your foster care coordinator for the state. And she has been doing webinars. We've been doing presentations throughout the state. And so hopefully we've got this information to you. And now you are under an obligation to work with uh, Children's Division and work with them as far as transportation and best decision making for placement for foster care students. <laughs> Good question, Debbie. Um, the question is the uh, fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residents, um, and they're considered homeless. They were considered homeless for the remainder of the school year. That is correct. If you determine that a student is McKinney-Vento eligible and you identify them as McKinney-Vento, they remain McKinney-Vento for the remainder of the school year, even though they find permanent housing. Now, the big change under ESSA is that once they find permanent housing, you are still responsible for transportation. That is a huge change from past law from No Child Left Behind. In the past, after they found permanent housing, the transportation piece of McKinney-Vento would drop away. Everything else stayed in place but the transportation. But now, under ESSA, if a family who's been deemed homeless now finds permanent housing midway through the school year, they still have the right to come back to your school, but you also have the obligation to transport them. So transitional shelters, we get this a lot of times in our more urban cores where they have those transitional shelters. They are eligible for McKinney-Vento. Okay? And you can see that <coughs> citation from the federal law where it was a decision that was filed back in 2002. Let's talk a little bit about age. Um, the Act, of course, applies to all children and youth who are age 21 and under who are eligible for a public school education. Now, that is age 22 for those children with disabilities. Um, if they're incarcerated, um, McKinney-Vento does not deal with incarcerated youth. They are now wards of the state, and then the state is in, then responsible for educating them. I jumped ahead of myself. There's that slide. So like I said, children and youth who are incarcerated should not be considered um, McKinney-Vento eligible. So enrollment, when we talk about enrollment, we're talking about immediate enrollment. Um, immediate means today. Um, you know, oftentimes I'll talk to parents where kids have been out of school for two and three weeks. That is not acceptable. Immediate means that they're actively involved in school. They're not just sitting in the cafeteria doing worksheets for you. Immediate enrollment means just that, immediate. Okay? So I think we've, we've had this theme throughout our presentation today about how you question families and how sensitive you have to be and how respectful you have to be. You know, you can't have an invasive probing attitude with these families. They're going to just shut down with you. Oftentimes, they're, maybe they're ashamed, um, you know, of the situation that they're in and they don't want to have to repeat their story a thousand times to five different people in the school district. So we have to be very cognitive of how we're asking questions, okay? So immediate enrollment, like we said, is immediate. Okay, Sign them up for free and reduced lunch. That's the easiest thing you can do for McKinney-Vento. They don't have to fill out any paperwork. All it is is a memo to your school food people saying Donna Cash has now been identified as McKinney-Vento and is eligible for free and reduced lunch. You can send that memo once a year, twice a year. I would update it you know, if, as you have new students added to it. So it may be something that you do daily or weekly, depending on the number of homeless students you have in your school. So while you're making that determination of homeless status, the student has to be enrolled. Okay? So if you find out later 
that they were trying to manipulate the system or they were trying to lie about where they actually were staying and they're really not McKinney Vento eligible, then you have to let that person know why they're not eligible and you have to give them a letter explaining why. And then you also have to let them know about the due process, that dispute resolution. You should have policies in place that give you the guidelines on that dispute resolution. And keep in mind that you have to follow that dispute resolution if you determine a family is not homeless. And the next question we have is, what if a student has an IEP? How do we determine what services to provide? Oops, some of that question disappeared. Um, <clears throat> what do we determine what services to provide if we don't have the records? Well, some of that is, you know, you being able to ask the family, Kathleen, about, you know, what services was the student receiving? Um, you may have to make some determinations on whether you want to follow that IEP from that other school district or if you want to do some more testing and, type, you know, and come up with others yourself. And so that is something as you get into, if you have a student who has an IEP or special needs, that you may need to reach out to our special ed division and talk to them about what to do in the interim. Okay. I think that we have another question there <coughs> from Karen. Um, she has a family who's been residing in a shelter since August. Initially, I set up transportation services through a private service until the students were routed by the bus company. OK. The students reside in our district and are eligible to ride the school bus from the shelter, the corner bus stop. The case manager at the shelter is fine with the school bus picking the children up. However, mom would prefer the children be picked up by the transportation service, which is costly. Do we continue to pay for transportation services, or can we set up? Hold on. Can we set up? And it didn't go on after that. I'm assuming you say bus. So Karen, I would. I think it's a point where you bring mom in and ask her. Um, you know, if they're residing in a domestic violence shelter, then maybe mom has reasons why she doesn't want them to go to the corner bus stop. We had this in Kansas City one time where um, a father actually found out where the shelter was. I don't know how that happened, but he did. And then he was able to follow the students enough to find out where the shelter was because of the bus stop. So. I think that it's going to take a little bit more talking with the mom and maybe the shelter provider to sit down and discuss the transportation options and what you have going with this particular family. I think that it's a little bit too generic of a question for me to really answer specifically. And I think it's going to take some in-depth conversation you have with that mother and the shelter provider to find out why mom is reluctant to put them on the bus versus um, the taxi. Okay. So let's talk about school of origin and school of residency. <clears throat> the school of origin is a school that the child or youth attended when permanently housed or, and there's a big or in there that people often don't think about and forget, it's the school in which the child was last enrolled. So you really could have two schools of origin, okay? Um, depending on the scenario, so you keep that in mind as you're trying to make a determination about school of origin for a child. The school of residency is pretty simple. It's just the current physical dwelling where they're putting their head down at night. Okay, we've got another question there. Let's go back to that one. Um, at the secondary level, it's difficult to balance the immediate enrollment and also getting information to make the best scheduling choices for students based upon their records, which could in, you know, include important information regarding placement needs, behavioral supports, etc. Families often don't know, don't want to tell, or don't want to disclose. Um, so we also have the new ESSA guidelines stating we need to assist with pres you know, preserving credits and grades. Is there a reasonable timeline which can be applied once we actually approve or complete the enrollment process at the district level? There is no timeline, Kathleen. There's nothing in the law that says uh, immediate is three days or immediate is five days or immediate is ten days. There is nothing in the law that says what immediate is. And so you're right. It is difficult. So oftentimes it is really having an in-depth conversation with that family or that student and trying to recreate maybe, you know, and it could be that you get it wrong. And if you get it wrong, you know, you just start from where you can. And you try to reach out. I mean, one of the things under ESSA is that your job description as a homeless liaison says that you are required to reach out to the school district where the children are coming from and to request those records, whether that's faxed, whether that's uh, sent through the mail, whether that's talking to a counselor at the school that can tell you what classes they have, um, you know, 
<clears throat> explore the options with the families about maybe a, you know, do they have a report card? Those are all things that you really need to have a discussion with the family. But you're going to do the very best you can, and it could be that if you get it wrong and he's in the wrong class and you already did that for a few days, you know, hopefully school districts are giving those records to you in a matter of days, not weeks. If it's taking you weeks to get something from a school district, by all means, please call my office and let me know so that I can help you navigate that, okay? So school selection, of course, um, the student has the right to continue in their school of origin for the entire time they're homeless. I think we've talked about that. And of course, we've talked about that they can continue that, uh, and we've talked about the transportation piece that is new. So if you're trying to send a child or a student back to a school district that's not the one that's requested by the parent or guardian, or keep in mind, if you have an unaccompanied youth, you as the liaison are acting as that quasi-parent for that unaccompanied youth. You're making sure that the unaccompanied youth understands what their options are, but then you're acting as that parent too and helping guide them. So make sure that they understand that they have these options, school of origin, school of residency, and what the difference means and what all those implications are, okay? Transportation. Uh, you know, transportation is a huge piece for McKinney-Vento for some districts, especially our more uh, urban core um, areas. So rural, it's just the opposite. We don't have transportation, so it may not work. You know, we don't have the options that we have. So I think you have to look at all of the different pieces for the transportation, and you're working out what's best. And again, under ESSA, it's you reaching out to that other school district and saying, hey, I have one of your students. They're wanting to come back to the school of origin. Let's talk about transportation, and let's talk about how we can make this and get it worked out. Because you can share transportation costs with that neighboring district if you're going between district of origin and district of residency, OK? I think these are questions that you need to ask, these ones that we have listed on the slide about transportation. What is the school of best interest? How old the student is? Uh, what are the transportation choices we have? Um, we would not, certainly not encourage city transportation, city transit. Um, we don't want students in city buses because we don't know who's driving them necessary or who's in the bus with them. Uh, gas reimbursement, you can certainly reimburse parents. I would not reimburse them with a card as far as a gas card, but I would certainly reimburse them if they were providing transportation. So I often get this question about crossing district or state lines. Remember, McKinney-Vento is a federal law, so we can go across state lines. So we have a lot of neighboring states that you may actually be on the line with, and you may have to share transportation. So if I have a student that's living in Arkansas, I may have to transport them into Missouri and vice versa. So you may be actually talking to a district that's out of state. If you have that problem, then uh, make sure that you contact me so that I can get the information for, and give it to you about which district or who's the state coordinator for that particular state. Dispute resolutions, we've hit just a little bit on. Every school district in Missouri has to have a dispute resolution process. If you disagree with a family's choice about what school district that they want to go into, then you have to enter into the dispute resolution. And that means that you have to give that dispute resolution and explain it to a parent. Don't just hand them the piece of paper and say, here's, here's the dispute. Um, I get a lot of phone calls from parents who say, well, yeah, they gave that to me, but I don't understand what it is. It's your job as the homeless liaison when you're entering and giving that dispute resolution that you're explaining it to the parent. And please do not make the assumption that the parent can read it and understand it. Um, it's something that you need to sit down with the parent step by step. Talk to them what each one of these little things mean. And make sure that they, you're reading it to them, that they understand, that they understand what the deadlines are, and that you're notifying them in the amount of time. They know what the t time frame is. And I would keep documentation of all of those kind of things as you were talking to them. Okay. I think we already hit upon this one, but we cannot segregate homeless students. Homeless students cannot be put in a separate classroom, and you have to adopt policies and procedures to make sure that they're not being stigmatized or segregated on the basis of their homelessness. Homeless children are categorically eligible for Head Start. In fact, two years ago, I think, I believe it's two years now, Head Start changed their definition to match that of McKinney-Vento. So um, new guidelines from Head Start actually allow Head Start collaboratives 
to uh, reserve seats for homeless students. Some might be doing that, so it is something that you should be having a collaborative conversation with your Head Start program, whether that's a, a separate from yours or if it's part of the LEA. So make sure that you're reaching out to those Head Start people. It's really important that you build those kind of relationships because you are then under ESSA required to not only identify but actively identify homeless students. So that means you're going out into your community and building these um, collaboration pieces, whether it's with those domestic violence shelters or Head Start or anyone else who might have students that could fall under McKinney-Vento. If you have a Head Start student who's coming into your kindergarten program, they might have younger siblings that might also be homeless. And so they're helping you identify at the same time. And I do have a copy of the dispute resolution process, Marilee. It's on our website. Keep in mind that might be changing because of some of the new guidelines under ESSA because they have changed that. Um, now a student has the right to enter into the dispute resolution dispute resolution process over eligibility and a couple of other things. So uh, keep in mind that might be changing, but we do have a copy out on our website. So districts are to identify a staff person as their local homeless educational liaison. And of course, the liaison has to ensure that the, the Homeless children are entitled to the same free public education as the rest of their peers. So if you want a list of those duties, we have a copy out on our website. It's not just do this, do that. As you can see, <laughs> this list goes on. Okay? You have to collaborate and coordinate with my office with community personnel, other school personnel. So you have to provide professional development to your school personnel. So it's not just that five minute conversation on the PD day at the beginning of the school year. It should be an ongoing conversation, whether it's email blast or uh, PowerPoints to your board or PowerPoints to the school bus transportation people. Uh, you should be providing PD throughout the school year to your staff members. Um, as you can see, this list goes on and on. Um, Jennifer mentioned the posting of notices of educational rights for children. That's the poster. There's a sample out on our web page that's been updated with the ESSA requirements. Um, you're making sure that you're identifying them. Uh, all of these different things that the duties of the liaison encompass. So as you can see, um, I'm not going to read each one of these. You can go back through at a later time and look at those because those are something that we do monitor through the tiered monitoring process for your title programs. So some of the things that you have to do is revise, review, develop. Uh, you, you should have a job description that talks about what your homeless job description is, about what your duties are. Um, needs assessment has become a huge piece under ESSA. Um, we expect to see a needs assessment for your homeless population. So that may be you reaching out to families and asking them what are their needs? What in your community is the overpowering need for your homeless population? How do you do enrollment? identification, what is your process, how do you handle records, how do you do the grievance process, all of these things. So here's our contact information. Um, if you have any last minute questions here that you want to type into the chat pane, we'll be happy to answer them. Jennifer and I um, are excited that we have this collaboration going and we'll continue to build it and hopefully have more webinars for you. If you have specific questions that you would like to um, actually have answered, you can feel free to either email us or call us. Our contact information here is on this last slide. Um, what is the requirement format for needs assessment? Um, Tracy, there's a sample needs assessment in the toolkit from the National Center for Homeless Education that you can use as a template. Um, I think a needs assessment can be as in-depth as you want it to be. Um, I know that the Springfield Public School District works with partnerships to actually have a needs assessment yearly or bi-yearly perhaps um, that they do as a community as a whole. So it might be something that you reach out to your partners throughout your community and say, you know, I know that we have this need, now we need to identify what we have to do to get that. Um, what are the deadlines for the needs assessment? Well, you have a homeless set aside that's a requirement for your Title I budgets. Those are due July 1st. We would expect to see um, Title I set asides in that budget and there should be a needs assessment that's tied into that. So that needs assessment is something that you should do on a yearly basis. So I'm, I'm going to say that you need to have that done before July 1st. And you certainly would want to have it done before your student body uh, kind of 
scatters for the summer break. So I would think that it'd be an ongoing process as far as how you look at that and constantly asking, um, you know, what are our needs? Your community needs might change depending on, uh, as an example, Joplin. You know, their needs the day before the tornado were probably not as significantly as different than maybe every other district might uh, around them might have been. But the day after the tornado, their needs assessment changed dramatically. So they probably had to sit down as a community and say, what do we have to do now for our homeless population? So I think those are all part of that needs assessment and, and how you develop partnerships with community um, members. And so you should be meeting with your uh, county or city uh, emergency management team. Because what does happen to student records if they are destroyed? Do you keep them off site like Joplin did on a, a different server? Um, if you don't, perhaps that's something your district might think about. Because what happens to student records if they were destroyed today? How are you going to recreate them. Are you storing them off-site? If not, maybe that's something you should ask. So I think a needs assessment should start um, probably now and start to be uh, worked on and looked at throughout the school year. Any other questions for us? We'll wait a few minutes. We've got somebody typing. Oh, thank you, Tracy. Um, we really appreciate you attending today. Um, we hope that this answers some questions. If nothing else, we hope that it starts a dialogue between you and some community partners. And whether that's a domestic violence shelter or victimization, um, please keep in mind all of the resources that Jennifer provided to us today, which I thought were great. And um, reach out to us for any questions you might have. Thank you for attending today. We appreciate your time. If you have questions, as always, just reach out to us. Thank you. The recorded webinar will be available on Desi's recorded webinar page probably within the next week. The PowerPoint is currently out there if you need to print that out and you want to share it or if you just want it for, um, for information purposes. Is the needs assessment a new requirement? Yes, Mary Lee, it is. Um, I think that we probably always wanted to be part of a needs assessment as far as your Title I world, but now is, I mean, they specifically have to have um, homelessness in their needs assessment and their Title I programs and plans. So you're not going to be able to provide a needs assessment for a homeless program unless you do it and then provide it to your Title I people for that homeless set aside. You're going to have to have that documentation so that we're looking at that and making sure that the needs of your homeless students are being addressed in that Title I plan. I think you're going to see more and more of that needs assessment piece, too. I think it's just an, an, another effort for the U.S. Department of, um, of Education to tie us into other programs that we need to be collaborating with. So, Any additional questions? If not, we're going to sign off. Thank you for joining us today.